So welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to those still joining online. We know that there are hundreds of you out there following along online what we're talking about here today at the summit. For those of you here in the room, I hope you had a good lunch and were able to enjoy the excellent views of Sofia and of Abade whetted your appetite for this afternoon. We are starting with another panel, same formula as before. We will have a keynote speaker to introduce the subject and then a discussion dialogue between our panelists. As before, we do want you to ask questions. You can do that by raising your hand in the room. Of those of you online, you can also use the Slido tool to get your questions in. We'll be using that again. As before, you just go to slido.com and type in IP enforcement. You should be able to follow that. You should also see there another question for you that is related to the topic of our first panel. Our first panel this afternoon is information sharing, breaking down silos between rights holders, intermediaries and law enforcement. And we're asking you what are the biggest challenges faced in information sharing. So type in one word, it could be anything from resources to language to Resources, again, that's always one of the ones we get many, many times when we ask this question. So we're going to talk about how an efficient regulatory framework really needs joined up thinking. It's especially when we want to talk about the use of new technologies, which obviously play a key role, as we've heard over and over this morning. We want to see safe, secure, but proper enforcement and sharing of information between all stakeholders, including right holders, intermediaries, and law enforcement agencies. And of course, they all have their own particular concerns about what information they want to share. We're going to kick off with a keynote who unfortunately cannot be here in person. He's in Strasbourg, presumably voting this morning on the AI Act. But we have got a video message from Axel Voss, member of the European Parliament. Let's have a look. So, dear colleagues, dear team from the EUIPO and dear friends, I'm glad to have the opportunity to participate in this panel on the IP Enforcement Summit, even if it is only virtually. I would have loved to be with you in Sofia, but unfortunately, my agenda does not allow. So the question of the enforcement of IP rights is still of utmost importance for us. I think that intellectual property is becoming increasingly important, especially with the changes that digitization brings with it and should also bring with it. Uh, digitization in Europe requires an immense amount of space for innovation and creativity, and if we want a progressive Europe, we must also ensure that progress can be generated in Europe. We must ensure the competitiveness of our companies by promoting innovation and creativity as the foundations of intellectual property. Nevertheless, I'm concerned about movements that no longer regard intellectual property as a full right. I felt this particularly in the context of the copyright reform four years ago. The internet is the main hub for copyright pro protected works. Users can access these works there in many new forms and using new business models. In this context, however, it is becoming increasingly difficult for right holders to enforce their copyright and to be adequately remunerated for the use of their works. This threatens the European cultural and creative industry. Technic advances in the digital realm are therefore makes new demands on copyright and we had to ask ourselves how we want to continue to protect intellectual property. With the reform four years ago, we have taken an immensely important step here and positioned ourselves clearly for the protection of innovations, for the protection of creativity, and ultimately for further economic development. Still, Five member states have not until today implemented the directive in their national law. The Commission should definitely be strict on this 
as far as I know, they referred these member states to the Court of Justice earlier this year. With the technical developments, we also need to continue the discussion about IP protection and enforcement. Now we are dealing with the regulation of artificial intelligence. Here, too, it is essential to make room for digital process and progress. We need strong digital products from Europe to maintain and grow our economy. For this, we need creative minds and innovative ideas that move us forward. We have seen how quickly in a global crisis like the corona pandemic, inventive ideas become essential and how dependent we become on innovations. In return, however, we must also make a clear commitment to protecting these ideas and innovations. The Digital Services Act brought up new rules which are, in my opinion, not comparable, but also not satisfying from a copyright perspective. So far, I guess we can live with it, but especially in the light of the emerging technological developments, life events must be better protected. In this light, new challenges are ahead if we are looking to new developments, especially digital developments like ChatGPT, the metaverse, or robo-journalism, robo-music, or robo-texts, some old questions do come up again, like uh, what we need is a copyright register and how we cope on a transatlantic level maybe our conference will already find some answers. I wish you a fruitful and successful discussion to bring forward the enforcement of IP law, especially inside of new technologies. Please let me know your results and keep contact to my to my office and to me especially that we can continue our work in promoting copyright protected works. All the best for you, your Axel. Indeed, uh, as he mentioned, it's quite a big day for the European Parliament on Digital Matters in Strasbourg. I'm sure many of you will have seen the notifications during the lunch break that they have voted on the AI Act, but something to discuss perhaps later on. Um, we're going to stay on this panel looking at the information sharing issue that has become something of a thread through the previous discussions, but we're going to break down the silos. We're going to talk about specifically rights holders, intermediaries and enforcement. So please welcome to the stage my four panellists to join me. May Bertello, who is the Senior Director of Anti-Counterfeit at Vinted. We also have Jean-Paul Forceville, Director of European and International Relations at La Poste. Leo Longar is Brand Protection Director at LVMH. And Claudia Martinez-Felix is Deputy Head of Unit from DG Grow in the European Commission. Thank you all so much for joining us. So I think we'll do the usual uh, quick tour de table. Tell us what you're working on and what your considerations are at the moment uh, and a bit about yourself. May, you can start. I'm sure many people have heard of Vinted, but give us the background anyway. Hi, thank you so much. Works? Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, so thank you so much for having me today. I work for Vinted, which is uh, currently the Europe uh, largest uh, platform dedicated to fashion in second hand. Um, so we're a Lithuanian company. And right now we have uh, 80 million users and we're operating in 19 countries in Europe, mostly separated between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, and we're now more than 1,700 employees. Um, on my side, so I'm Senior Director of Anti-Counterfeit. I joined Vinted only 10 months ago uh, with a background of 10 years uh, working uh, as Head of Legal and uh, anti-counterfeit for um, another platform uh, in France. Well, thank you very much, May. Uh, Jean-Paul, uh, talk to us about La Poste Group and how you intersect with the, uh, the anti-counterfeiting issues. Yes, uh, 
Good afternoon to all, and um, happy to be here with you. Thank you for inviting uh, La Poste. You might be su surprised maybe to, to find me on the podium, and uh, maybe at the end of this uh, panel, you will know that it was right to, to have you, us here. Well, La Poste is, of course, the um, uh, postal designated operator, that is uh, the, the universal service provider for postal issues in, 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 in France. We are also a bank, a bank insurance company. We are the 11th bank of the Eurozone. And we are also an expressist with Geopost DPD, which is uh, the uh, leader for deferred express in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, and uh, we also are more and more active in, in, in the digital uh, uh, field. Um, some figures, 35 billion turnover, 35 billion euro turnover, 44% is international, 245 employees, um, 2.5 billion parcels delivered, um, and uh, missions of public service, of course. Um, we transport many things, and uh, we'll come back to it. Um, and uh, naturally, we cannot exclude that uh, in some of the parcels and package we, we transport, there are some counterfeit. We realized, we realized this uh, some years ago, and uh, we are working hard on it. I will come back probably on that before, be later, sorry. Thank you. Uh, now, Leo, uh, LVMH Group is more than 75 brands that are some of household names. Um, and I also know you're working a bit on blockchain. Uh, so tell us uh, about your perspective. Yeah, so my starting line is usually I work for LVMH, but I don't do LV nor MH. Uh, it's quite a, quite a large group, of course. Uh, we have different anti-counterfeiting teams. Some of my colleagues from MH are here, for instance. Uh, but my team takes care of 27 uh, brands of the, of the group. Uh, Dior, Kenzo, Givenchy, uh, also some watches like Zenit, Agave, Riblo, etc. And uh, we obviously uh, take care of all the on and offline anti-counterfeiting operations. With a, with a big part on the on the action side, uh, I can go into some details. On there's a almost an industrial side to that, where we we seize over six million goods. We have twenty thousand actions per year. We we take down over two million illicit content online. So there's quite a quite industrial part of that. We want to do in-depth operation as well, and then we do a lot of cooperation, and that's the the topic of the panel here. We do a lot of cooperation both with intermediaries, we have lots of discussions on the, on the online side with, uh, with different uh, stakeholders there, but also on the ground with the authorities uh, where we go and see and visit them and train them and, and talk with them uh, how to improve their actions. Well, thank you. Um, Claudia, I'm sure we're all familiar with DG Grow and the European Commission, but tell us a bit about the unit. What is intangible economy? <laughs> thank, you. thank you for the question. Um, indeed, intangible economy has been the name, the new name that was granted to the unit uh, that uh, historically has been always uh, responsible for the IP legal framework and also for the policies that we develop in the context of IP enforcement implementation. We are um, basically um, ensuring that the IP action plan that you may have heard already, it was already adopted in 2020, with uh, tons of deliverables that we are actually uh, delivering on them. Um, we heard this morning um, my big, big boss, Commissioner Breton, uh, he mentioned already a, a number of achievements, and I think it's very relevant um, to bring also to the table the modernizations uh, of the rules that we're doing on designs, because obviously designs uh, is important, design protection for, the, for, for, for enforcing uh, those rights, and we heard uh, Piccolinos before no? on, on that front. But we also um, just rolled out a new uh, scheme for protecting uh, geographical indications on craft and industrial products, uh, and we recently also have adopted the patent package, uh, which contains three big pillars um, complementing the unitary pattern uh, that we are also uh, supporting and rolling out um, from, from the commission side. So um, this uh, is in short what our unit is doing, uh, but obvious, obviously in the context of IP enforcement, 
Uh, we are um, also responsible for the memorandum of understanding on the online sales of counterfeited that um, was already uh, mentioned and, and briefly discussed in the previous breakout session. Uh, and of course, also the MOU on advertising. This is also um, you know, under the sort of auspices of, of, of the work of our unit and the cooperation with uh, the, you know, different intermediaries and different uh, right owners uh, become very precious also in light of the new legal uh, regulatory framework that we're having um, in place uh, with the DSA uh, that certainly um, we will come back uh, into that uh, in terms of, uh, of other points. But that, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you all. So we know where, where everyone's coming from, but I want to ask you all the same question, that sort of same central question, which is what is undermining information sharing in this area? Because I think it's a fairly big consensus that information sharing and collaboration is better in general, but how do we get stakeholders together working properly to fight uh, counterfeiting? May, do you want to start? What do you see as undermining information sharing? What are the concerns? I would say GDPR to start <laughs> with, <laughs> trade secrets, mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, business sensitive information. That would be the first thing. And that's why I think it's, it's a good idea that we have the MOU, for example, or bilateral uh, exchanges so, so that we can actually like, share information, but in a confidential environment. Uh, same question, Jean-Paul. Where do you see the challenges or the hurdles? Well, um, of course, mm -hmm. data sharing mm -hmm. is, is a key issue. And, 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 and for instance, uh, uh, we provide nearly 3.2 million uh, electronic declaration to, France to French customs every month. So there is a lot of information and, and this uh, quantity uh, of data enables customs to, to better identify potentially illicit goods or networks uh, and to remove them from the postal circuit. And, and, and we, we, we have, thanks to this information, um, withdrawn which compared to 3.2 million might uh, look uh, too little. Uh, already 23 uh, kilo items in 2022. Uh, beside that, um, we, 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 we can only share this information with the customs because uh, legally, there is a legal framework. For instance, it's not possible for us to, to, to share data with the, uh, the right holders, for instance. Uh, we are not allowed mm. to, to, to do that. Uh, maybe that could be changed. Um, for the time being, all data must be first centralized by the customs authorities. Um, we will then decide to share them with the right holders or not. L last information about, uh, uh, about customs. Um, we, we might come back to the GDPR yeah. maybe later. We will. <laughs> so I, I stop here. <laughs> okay. Leo, from your perspective, do you agree with, with what you've heard so far as those are the biggest challenges? Yes, I, I, would, I would add uh, the three main points I see. One is the tools. We need obviously the right tools to, to share information. There are some existing tools. Uh, the IPEP uh, from the UIPO, for instance, is actually quite a good tool. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's working. We're, we're feeding it with some information as well. But then comes in another hurdle, it's the willingness of people to use it, actually. Mm -hmm. And if, if you, uh, you need to convince uh, people on the ground, police, uh, customs, etc., to actually really use it and understand their issue as well, uh, and that's, that's the, the, the third hurdle, which besides the tools and the willingness, is the resources. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, an average uh, custom officer or police officer, he has so many different tools to use, so if you put on top of that a, a new EU tool, uh, well, you might not have time or the willingness to, to really get into that. So that's, that's the, three main, the three main topics. The, the, the same issues I see with the, in the exchange of cooperation with the intermediaries, with the platforms, for instance. With some platforms, we have a relatively good understanding. Uh, it works quite well, especially on the e-com side. I think the, the most, uh, the, the, the bigger e-com uh, uh, platforms 
are uh, interested in cooperating with us, they're ready, they exchange, we really look, uh, we search uh, solutions together, so that's working quite well. With others, it's much more difficult, right? There's really a willingness uh, issue there. Uh, social media, not to mention them, much yeah. more difficult than, than uh, the e-com platforms, for instance. Uh, so you, you, need, you need that readiness from, from all stakeholders as well. Yeah, well, I mean, social media and influencers, of course, are a whole different ballpark than we're used to dealing with in the past. Um, I will say, because I did ask you to put on Slido, some people have already started doing it, and there's a great deal of overlap already. Um, resources, reaching the right people, cooperation, protectionism, trust, availability of data for all, and proper characterization of the information are two issues that have come up, as well as one global dedicated platform as something that uh, I think... Uh, are, we are seeing as one of the challenges. You can keep putting these in. I am keeping an eye on what you're writing down, so we'll, we'll try and touch on all the points. Um, from your perspective, Claudia, let me ask you a slightly different question um, regarding GDPR, the uh, General Data Protection Regulation, or as I've heard it described to me by Americans, goddamn privacy rules. So tell us about how we can ensure that the GDPR isn't used against enforcement efforts. I mean, it's, it's tricky to, to get the balance right. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I would say, unfortunately, there is no magic reply at this stage. GDPR rules are the rules that we have. It's composed of three different um, uh, directives, uh, e-privacy, you have the uh, data protection, obviously, for the GDPR for, for, for personal data, and then you also have the one that relates really to the data process by law enforcement authorities, but all have in common, I think, um, something which is what do we understand by personal data and in which circumstances such personal data can be actually processed and exchanged. And there are a number of conditions. This is not a jungle. This is not just, you know, uh, a, a blocking hurdle. On the contrary, I think it's important to understand that there are uh, concrete situations where such personal data, and what do we understand by personal data? That's also another um, a, a question to look into it. Huh? But um, can be can be can be processed if, for example, there is a legal mandate, certainly but also if there are legitimate aims uh, that uh, are being pursued by that third party that wants to process the data. Currently, the Commission is, well, and the, GD and the GDPR um, authority, the supervisor, is actually updating uh, guidance on, on what we understand are these legitimate aims. And in this context, um, part of the work that uh, the Commission uh, is doing is also to ensure that we can get some further clarifications in the context of the, um, of the, of, of the fighting against counterfeiting. Um, maybe just to complement on that, uh, because um, I think colleagues have mentioned most of the problems that we have heard uh, from the consultations that we have taken in the last um, uh, two years. And information sharing certainly has been uh, very high on the agenda, and that's an area where the Commission is taking it very seriously. And what we have also seen is that there is this legal complex you know, uh, environment in terms of GDPR rules, but not only also, for example, in terms of the uh, possibility for competition rules you know, to apply what type of... Uh, exchange of information can actually take um, uh, take place between the different uh, uh, um, uh, stakeholders, and in that front, also in the context of this initiative that we are uh, preparing, um, it's it's it was already announced in the IP action plan. That's the toolbox against counterfeiting. We also aim at at signalling um, these these available tools. Uh, it can be you know, additional guidance, clarifications in those areas where we have understood from the uh, consultations that there is a need for further clarification. <coughs> and so that is also something um, we would be uh, commenting. And I don't know if I will have the opportunity to briefly touch upon the competition uh, aspect because... Yeah. Well, and also there's a plethora of different authorities there. We've got competition authorities, data protection authorities. I mean, there is a lot of advice for controllers that they need to absorb. Absolutely. Uh, Jean-Paul, uh, you also raised the issue of GDPR. Give us your... Well, well briefly, um, and to complement what I was saying about data, 
th our problem also is that we are not an integrated network. We depend on the information coming from other posts. Mm -hmm. And um, you, you, you can imagine that certain posts have uh, less capacity, uh, less investment power to be able to uh, send us all the quality information we need now uh, to uh, go in front of the, of, of the customs. And um, that's where we, we, we can also uh, use um, uh, artificial intelligence to, to, to cope with this issue, but we'll come back probably later on this. Um, on GDPR, just an example, uh, the, 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 the American authorities have taken what they call the, the uh, Stop Act. Uh, you probably heard to, to, to stop all the narcotics, etc., etc. And um, the information which is required by uh, the U.S. Customs is, according to the European Board of uh, Data Protection, not compatible to the GDPR. So uh, we are working with a kind of provisional exemption, but uh, it will not, we, we will not be able to continue like this. And, and there are also some different interpretation if you talk to Digitaxud or if you talk to uh, mm -hmm. this board of uh, protection. Well, May, let me come back to you and ask, um, what sort of information does an organization like yours need to help identify counterfeit goods and tell me a bit more as well about you know the sort of e-commerce solutions that you might put in place mm -hmm. so in terms of information actually everything uh, even the most basic information the, the thing is that so when you're a right owner let's say either you're like protecting one brand or um, many brands like you are um, but on our point of view as a platform we are we are facing everything and sometimes we don't even know that the brand exists if it's not part of the most famous one, so that would be it. And um, so what is crucial for us is, let's say, the new prices, the, the price ranges on which uh, we would most likely find counterfeit goods, um, how to make the difference, for example, of, uh, like between authentic and fake items and so on. So it's all the information, the keywords and everything. I mean. And without wishing to, to run away down a tech rabbit hole, is there you know, AI tools or, or sort of predictive uh, tools that can help you do that? So, um, at Vinted, it's going to be a little bit long, but I, I need to explain. So, we have two things to keep in mind. The, the first one is, because we are applying restrictions to users, so we always need to find the right balance. So that's the first thing. And the second one is that we are facing super large volumes, so we need to work on automation. But we need to develop things, and this is uh, this can take a lot of time. Um, now we are kind of like reshuffling everything and rebuilding the whole anti-counterfeit strategy that is based on three pillars. Now, the first one is mostly anti-counterfeit policies, processes, tools, filters, algorithms, and so on. Um, we are also going to work on artificial intelligence, but I cannot say anything right now. Um, and then the other part, which is also really important, uh, which is actually knowledge, training, and quality. And the last one for external relations, so cooperation with right owners, uh, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of features that we've uh, implemented in the last month, so first, uh, we, we are more severe now with the users who are trying to list uh, counterfeit goods. So we have a new system of strikes, which, which is much more severe than the previous one. Um, for example, now we have on specific ranges of products uh, the, the request of adding minimum three pictures. And, and the last one, uh, which is um, uh, the delayed publication feature, meaning that uh, listings would not be visible uh, on the platform right away, but you would have to wait 48 hours. And then during this time, our algorithms are checking if uh, it's uh, okay um, or not. So that's well, it. thank you. Leo, I'd like you to weigh in at this point as well about the information sharing. I mean, you're representing a huge corporation, but does information get stuck in silos? Do you think that happens? Well, information, it, that's a big issue, right? And, and we, need, we need, obviously, technology to, to help us doing that. We, we have a few programs running within our group to help us use our own data because we have lots of, we've been doing that for decades, so we have lots of our own data that we're not using sufficiently to actually increase the targeting, right? We, we want to, to get the big fishes, the, the high-value targets, as we call them, and that's through use of technology, right? There's, 
there's surprisingly not that much existing that really works well. Uh, so we're trying to build uh, some ourselves. We work with, uh, with startups, with, with various uh, service providers that help us on that front. But technology is certainly, is certainly the answer. And, and the same is true on the authority side. We were actually, a few months back, we were at the Turkish-Bulgarian uh, border in Capitan Andrevo. And we, we saw the, how, they, how they control and what they do there. Fantastic job by the Bulgarian uh, custom officers. There's 3,000 trucks crossing that border every day. So there's no way uh, you can check them all, right? So the only way, uh, and it's worse on the postal side, right? The, the millions of, of uh, small parcels coming in, there's no way you can check them all. It's below 5%, I think, what you, what you can really check. So the answer to that avalanche coming in is, is technology, right? But we're, we're definitely not there yet. There's a few interesting things uh, that, that start to exist, but we're, we're far from having an efficient system that, that really works. And can I ask you about what sort of collaboration you might have in, in place with intermediaries? Often we think intermediaries simply means digital intermediaries, but with postal services, with customs. I mean, are you seeing that you can work hand in glove with them or is there still a, a little bit of work to be done? That really depends on the countries. Uh, on, in some countries it works really well. Uh, the, the authorities are, are very open and actually asking for, for our help because in a lot of the cases we do quite a large part of the police work, right? We would do all the investigation and we go with, with the final uh, file to the police and tell them where, where to raid. In the end, you need police officer getting going somewhere and, and raiding a place, right? So there's no technology is not going to remove that part. So you, you definitely need the, the resources on the ground. But there is a lot of positive developments. We're talking to La Post as well, to other intermediaries. Uh, and in general, I definitely see an openness on, on most, uh, most stakeholders in this area. It's obviously dependent on some countries where it's much more difficult. I uh, don't want to mention some here, but there are regions where it's really difficult to cooperate with the authorities and also with, with, the, with the online stakeholders. There's, you can see some making a real effort and others where they're simply reluctant or, or you can see, well, they, they, they make money on the counterfeiters in the end, right? So they don't have an interest uh, working with, with the rights holder necessarily. Well, Jean-Paul, I'd be interested to get your side of this story um, in terms of working with um, industry. I mean. Is there an argument to be made that if public resources are limited, it's useful to have private sector doing the heavy lifting and then uh, feeding back into uh, the enforcement side? Well, I, I think that here, um, and, and, and I see it, um, I have been chairing Post Europe, the, the organization of the Post in, 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 in Europe for, for 12 years. So, and I've seen that in some countries uh, there is uh, reflection, there is work on, on, on counterfeit and, and some others where it's not the case. There are countries where there is a good cooperation between the post and the customs, in the case in France, really close com, uh, um, collaboration and, and, and sometimes uh, post-Europe was useful to connect the two because they were not talking together. Um, <coughs> I think which is quite very useful also in the dialogue between uh, the right holders <coughs> and, and, and La Poste uh, is also to be all, all members of Unifab, which is a very active, with Delphine was uh, at my uh, place uh, this morning and, and, and frankly it, it helps. Uh, so that, but here I, I think that um, we, we should also probably listening to the debate this morning uh, up there, um, talking about consumers. Um, we, we, we should also, the, 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 the um, commission probably should include m maybe more, a little more, the, the, the consumers in this. Well, I do want to ask <laughs> from the commission side representing Claudia, uh, what can the commission or the EU framework do to support countries or, or regions at whatever level? And Tell us a little bit as well about the toolbox. Yes, thank you for that question. Mm. Well, from I mean, from from what we see, um, and I will be I will jump into the toolbox in a minute. But what we have seen, of course, in the last uh, recent developments, is that a lot is happening. Um, and I think from from the Commission side, we're pushing 
very much uh, for that greater cooperation. Uh, we see it with the new regulatory framework that will be uh, fully um, applicable as of uh, February next year. I'm talking, of course, from the digital dimension. And so I'm talking about uh, the, the DSA that uh, was already you know, well discussed earlier on. There has been now recently, of course, a new proposal from the Commission to reform the customs union. I think that's also very important to flag uh, when it comes to, uh, as well, data uh, sharing and a new data hub, um, which we agree it's far in, in the time uh, we're talking about 2035, but that's also something that is uh, already uh, happening in terms of gathering further intelligence uh, between the different customs authorities, and I think this, this, is, this is very important and, and, and we need to keep on uh, encouraging. Then there is also, and I'm looking as well at international level cooperation, we, we were earlier hearing this, this, this word of trust, right? Trust is so important, cooperation is so important at all levels, and I think this is where the Commission is also stepping in. It's efforts, for example, in the context of the OECD, um, uh, work streams uh, from the working group on illicit, illicit trade, uh, where we see as well a new working group on, on, on e-commerce, uh, online, and counterfeiting. And centrally there, the Commission is also, and my team is, 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 is participating in these discussions to ensure that we have landing zones across jurisdictions when it comes to also cooperation and fostering information sharing. But beyond, of course, what we are also doing in the context of the preparation of this initiative, um, which is a non-binding initiative uh, on counterfeiting, is, is also looking at what are currently the gaps uh, where we can still fill in uh, with additional, um, for example, I would call it tools, not necessarily new tools, but tools which are not being used sufficiently so that we actually recommend the use, and I think, we don't need to duplicate uh, what already uh, exists. We just need to make sure that everyone is well aware. And I'm just thinking, for example, of, uh, of, of this IPEP that has been already mentioned that EU IPO is, 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 is uh, deploying now even on an app. And then we need to ensure that all law enforcement authorities, market surveillance authorities, customs, but also right owners, and soon hopefully also platforms can actually join in. And this could be part of what we intend to um, as well uh, promote. But not only, I mean, we are also, uh, for example, looking at the way that in light of the new regulatory framework, voluntary cooperation arrangements for information exchange can actually be modernized. I'm talking about the MOU. When we, we were just discussing in the last plenary where we had all signatories sitting in the, in the table, that we want to launch a reflection, we want to launch um, a call, and that couldn't even, you know, uh, be extended, and, and, and that's a conversation that we need to engage, you know, other key actors, uh, notably not only the platforms themselves, but uh, obviously uh, transport and logistics services. We heard earlier on in one of the breakout sessions, payment services actors, uh, certainly, tied uh, with uh, specific, specific informa uh, information sharing uh, legislation on banking, uh, but still interesting to, to have them involved because there is a lot of information that has been you know, hosted there. And so those are areas that we are keen um, to explore uh, as, as we move uh, forward. Um, I, I could keep on going, <laughs> but I maybe just one last jump in, maybe just one last point. Yeah. I think it's important because I didn't mention our unit is also responsible for a very old directive. You may have heard IPRET, so from 2004, but still, you know, um, organizing how legal proceedings, for example, on IP uh, matters have to take place, and it's obviously um, subject to, um, if I may say. Improvement. So we have just launched a study as well to look, for example, on the on Article 8, which is the right uh, for information, because we have seen certain developments in, in, in the courts where we sense that we can go and give a bit of further feedback on that front to ensure that, for example, information is shared and there is a balance between the different rights that are protected, fundamental rights, uh, banking secrecy, that protection, but of course the right of the of the, um, for example, right owner to get the necessary information no? to, 
to get the, you know, from, from, from for example, the platforms or others. So that are areas that we are um, planning to cover in the in the context of the of the toolbox against counterfeiting. Leo, I think there was a, a point or two that you wanted to pick up on. Yeah, just to add that the, this this legal framework is obviously very important, right? And we that's an important puzzle piece in in, a, in our fight. And and uh, we have great hopes for for the DSA. I think that's going to be it's a very important piece of legislation that will that will help us a lot uh, will will help uh, or at least put additional uh, constraints on the on the online stakeholders so we'll, we really think that that might be a game changer a little bit uh, in Europe that there's also a bunch of uh, legal decisions which are which are very encouraging the Amazon Louboutin case and others which which really go in the sense of, of right holders as well so it's it's uh, it's a good environment currently for for right holders uh, the EU toolbox is, is definitely uh, proposing uh, interesting things. The, the difficult part is uh, either it's mandatory, right? It's a law and you have to do it, which, which is the DSA, which is very good for the, for the online stakeholders because otherwise they, they're not doing sufficiently, so you need to force them. Or you do, it, you do it on a voluntary basis, right? And then here you need to convince all the stakeholders to, to use a tool. And, and the IPEP is the, is the best example for that. That's an additional tool that, that can be used. But uh, yeah, if, if you have three others, uh, whether you're gonna use a four, fourth one, uh, you really need to convince the guys on the ground to, to use it. And that's a totally different uh, uh, game and, and decision. But yeah, so sometimes the mandatory stuff is, is necessary, unfortunately. May, let me ask you, um, I mean, if you want to comment on anything that's been said so far, but also what sort of collaboration is most useful for you? Um, with right with right owners, you mean? Um, so it depends. I think we have very different uh, kind of collaborations with uh, with brands. Um, I, I think what is most important for us is when we are really collaborating, meaning that we are receiving information from them and they are also sharing information with us. Um, what we can share, for example, can be like counterfeit patterns, trends, um, information on users if we have the author, like uh, an authority um, um, asking us to, to, to give the info. And, on, and from the brands, uh, of course, like all the, all the knowledge that is possible to give us. So, yeah. Um, I think we also have the results of our uh, poll. I think we may be able to see a word cloud if possible, up on the screen to get a sense of uh, people have been <laughs> typing in what they think is most important um, of the sub subject that we're discussing. I don't know, can we see that on the panel screen yet? Perhaps, mm, yes, there we go, it works. Wonderful technology. So <laughs> it's uh, some quite long phrases there rather than single words. Proper characterization of the information, uh, overarching responsible authority, counterfeit hiding in postal, uh, trust, cooperation, reaching the right people, resources, content versus status, availability of data for all, one global dedicated platform, and protectionism. It's covering a lot of ground there. Um, I'd be interested, uh, Jean-Paul, uh, just to get your thoughts on any of that. Does any of that surprise you, or were you expecting these sorts of points to come up from our audience? No, frankly, I, I, I think that um, there is no... I, I like the, 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 the trust concept, uh, but it has to be, to be built in a way. We, we can see that we are not at that point here, and, um, but with more dialogue, um, with more also a legal, uh, le firm legal framework. Uh, uh, but I, I think that the, the, the dialogue, it, it, it's useless to, to, to say, uh, well, you are responsible for this and you are doing nothing, etc. That, that doesn't lead to anywhere. Um, but uh, uh, let's talk together and see how we can better uh, work, work together. But, Availability of data is really uh, key, and uh, um, because uh, it will help us uh, through the blockchain, through the EA, to to make some progress. Because uh, physically, it has a limit. On a day-to-day, -day in, in in our uh, premises, uh, we have cu uh, custom officers and and postmen going together and uh, trying to see where it come from. You can you should try to, 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 to check this and this and this and this. This will always re 
remain, and it is important that there is part of the human um, behavior and human know-how. But um, the, the, the IA and, and, and blockchain will also be much better. Well, we've moved beyond the, the blockchain hype era where every second panel in Brussels and the rest of Europe mentioned blockchain as a panacea for every ill of humanity. Um, but in reality, Leo, can you tell me what practical uh, solutions it's offering and, and how is it working for you? Uh, I totally echo what you just said. I mean, blockchain, we all thought it's going to change the, the, the whole game. It's obviously not, right? We, we have gained some experience with it now. There is some interesting uh, perspectives coming out of it, but on the one hand side, it's still relatively expensive, as we, as we heard uh, this morning as well. So uh, whether you want to, to do that for a certain type of products is, is really quite questionable. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, it's, it's, uh, you need to implement it into, into a whole ecosystem, right? So the, our group uses it for, for on, on some specific product, but it's actually more used for traceability, for, for uh, interaction with customers, uh, guarantee card and stuff like that, where it makes sense, right? You can, you can get a real benefit for, for as a customer from that. And the secure, thanks to the blockchain, and if you, if you buy a watch for 20,000 bucks, you, you uh, may be interested in that, right? However, uh, it's not really used sufficiently uh, on counterfeiting uh, topics, mm -hmm. right? There, there is initiatives, the blockathon of the EIPO and others, but I'm, I'm still struggling to see concrete examples, uh, very simple to use examples uh, on, on the counterfeit side. And that's when, when I talk with my colleagues internally who work on these projects, I'll tell them, well, in the end, I need a custom officer in Bulgaria or a police guy in, in Kazakhstan to be able to use this, right? With his, hopefully, smartphone or whatever he has, the tool he has, right? But it needs to be extremely simple and, and some level of security to be, to be really useful. And clearly, we're, we're not there yet with, with blockchain, and it's not, it's not the solution to all our problems, unfortunately. Uh, well, unfortunately, we don't have a customs person on this panel either, but I know that there are several in the audience. So when I throw the floor open in a few minutes, I hope one of you will raise your hands to at least ask a question or give us some perspective. Because for now, I want to come back to uh, Jean-Paul, because I know you're just back from uh, this conference you told me in Tokyo uh, with the uh, WCO and the postal services. Tell us a bit about that or what were the main themes that were being discussed there? Well. What organizes the, 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 the network, the postal network, is the Universal Postal Union, uh, a specialized uh, organization of the uh, United Nations. Um, its its uh, head office is in Bern. Uh, and the, by the way, the, the, the oldest organization, uh, because it was created uh, in 1874. So, um, yes, believe it or not, Last week, uh, I, had an event, uh, I had an intervention uh, for the first conference of the WCO, the World Customs Organization, and the UPU, which was organized in, in Tokyo. Um, and um, just a reminder, La Poste and, and, and some other posts, already in 2008, um, made a modification or, or, or drove a, a modification of the convention of the UPU to uh, make the counterfeit uh, items not acceptable in, in, in the postal sector. Is it respected? Probably not yet, but at least legally we, we have a kind of framework. And so it was the first time that at this level, even if there are regular operational meetings. It was the first time we, we, we had this meeting and I think it has been very, very fruitful to listen to each other uh, positions and needs and, 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 and issues. And um, there will be another one. There, there, is, there has been a, a common declaration uh, signed and we are going and of course, counterfeit has been discussed. Okay, well, I am going to, to throw it open to the floor now, and I see one hand here already. If we can get the microphone down. Any others? Anybody else? Well, okay, well, we'll take the front row first. <laughs> okay.
Okay. It's open. Thank you. I'm Gabriel Turku, from, a lawyer from Turku and Turku Law Office. And uh, it is the hottest topic quite at uh, this moment uh, about the information that should be shared by intermediaries, internet service providers and intermediaries uh, whatsoever, uh, carriers and so on. And of course, the biggest challenge is to have the right balance between rights. And, but this challenge and this goal for the right balance should not be considered as a step back for what was already gained by the right holders. And I'm referring to the few informations which shall be guaranteed according to the Article 8 from the Directive 48. These are given are not many, are a few, but are allowing the right holders to chase the bad guys. So when, uh, from my perspective, any time when we'd like to have a view over the right balance between rights, this should cannot put under the question these basic informations. Of course, we may think about figures, amounts of money, incomes, this shall be subject to a right balance, but not identities. This was the first consideration, and this was analyzed in various decisions. It was in uh, decision 580, uh, 580 for 2013 in Coty versus uh, uh, the German bank, and it was underlined before by uh, Claudia, and, and this goes to the conclusion that internet service providers, carriers, postal office, do have the obligations to provide these basic informations from Article 8 at request of the trademark holders. Not only from the authorities, because as long as the directive sh provides there is right and the obligation, this shall be come to a goal, to his scope, voluntary. Authorities shall come into subject only in case of opposition. But the cooperation should be the first choice. And this obligation assumed by the intermediaries is part of their business profile. It is a business conduct. And this a business uh, responsibility for consumers and from the trademark holders. You cannot decide that you may consider to provide these informations. Once you put yourself in such a position, you already refuse the request for informations, and this may bring to liability of the intermediary. And the last point which was raised by the representative of the commission is the new Union Customs Code, which is in the discussion now. And further, I know there is not much progress on the transparency of the information provided by the Customs Authority to the trademark owners. A link between Article 8 from the directive and the Union Customs Code to put together the same content of information could be useful, I believe. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, we don't have anything concrete. It's, as you say, still under discussion, so we'll uh, presumably still be talking about this in a year's time. Anybody else want to... Yes, I see another hand, of course, from Philips. Yeah. Yes, um, Jan de Visser, Philips again. <clears throat> um, I like this slide very much because the word trust is highlighted so clearly, and then I also see counterfeit hiding in postal. Um, yeah, then I can't but resist to make uh, a connection to... Um, the status that is given to several postal operators as authorized economic operators, meaning that they can do their own declaring in the EU and uh, they therefore fall outside the scope of what customs normally handles and otherwise they are their own customs. Now, we have evidence or at least strong uh, suspicion to believe that uh, the word trust in the context of how these postal companies are operating is, is completely abused in the sense that if you would look at their statistics, uh, so postal operators, look at the statistics of um, how many counterfeit cases they actually report to the right owners, 
and then take that against what customs normally report in the EU, and you will see a striking difference. In other words, the status that is given to these authorized economic operators is an abuse of uh, the position that, uh, yeah, right holders should have more transparency on how these people are operating. Uh, because what you now see is that for the sake of developing business, and some of these postal operators, PostNL for example in the Netherlands, aggressively does a lot of promotion in China directly for people to uh, solicit uh, for business and invite them in, in nice Chinese video clips to make use of their services. Uh, subsequently, packages are sent to the Netherlands. They are being anonymized before they actually are um, uh, landing at uh, the desk of the consumer. So you have a postal company anonymizing data, not being able to share, likely having bad statistics in how they perform versus how uh, averages look uh, in, on the customs level in Europe, and therefore dodging from the responsibility that is notably given the status of authorized economic operator. My goodness. <laughs> okay. Um, Leo, you want to react to that. I mean, I'm conscious not to tar everyone with the same brush, so let's avoid generalities if we can. No, no, j just to add to Jan's point, which, which is absolutely right, and, and I think you need to answer that one, I'm sorry. But j just to, to uh, echo your point, we, we did a study with, with the Swiss Watch Federation, and we, we found out that 30% of fake uh, watches uh, in Europe came from the Netherlands. I said, well, that, that's kind of weird, right? I mean, uh, clearly produced in China, 100% of fake watches are produced in China, but it's exactly what you said. It's, it's basically there's a, there's a link between Post and L and, and uh, Chinese counterfeiters who, who ship stuff to the Netherlands first and then disseminate it uh, throughout Europe. Once it's in Europe, in the EU, it's not checked anymore, and it's basically lost, right? So we actually have been talking to Post and L and, and to the Netherlands Customs as well. There's a real issue here. And yeah, just to echo your point. Can we, can we let uh, Jean-Paul get an answer in first? <laughs> well, yes. Um, we, we know that the OECD has made a, a review. The, the figures in 2019 was two-thirds of uh, the counterfeit uh, seized were coming from postal or express uh, companies. Um, so. What's the need to crucify the post on this with uh, figures that nobody can prove and, and, and behavior nobody can prove? Just let us sit together and, 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 and speak. And um, um, yes, but the, the, the post NL also has to take the flows coming from China Post. By the way, uh, we were discussing it before, uh, the, 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 the packages coming from uh, China, are, have, the postal w volumes have fallen down very sharply recently, and, and now the, the uh, uh, e-merchant, Chinese e-merchant, are, are uh, avoiding the, the, the postal flow. So uh, that's also a, a clear view that the postal have uh, no exemptions on, on customs issues. They 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 they, with, they, they apply ICS2. They, they 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 work on the level playing field. And and even in the U.S. Um, now the uh, uh, audits of the U.S. have written in a recent report that between commercial and postal uh, customs uh, declaration, now postal is a disadvantage than commercial. So we should stop you know, having this, this, this kind of, of, of discussion, as I said before your intervention. Just sit together and, and see what we can do. And uh, if there are operators that misbehave, they should be uh, put in face of their responsibilities. But um, uh, I, I can tell you that I'm talking for La Poste, uh, for sure, uh, we, we, we are not in this kind of uh, behavior. We, oh, oh gosh, okay, right at the end, all the hands go up. We have one here just in the front row, I think you already have the microphone, and then we'll come to the gentleman further back. Thank you. I hear about trust and cooperate, and um, I'm looking for the screen. It's a lot of words, but nowhere it's consumer. Well, and you could have typed uh, it in. 
And I think... <laughs> that you have the power. <laughs> and I think, I think, I represent the consumer's organization. Uh, what I think, I want to hear the position or our review for the, the people in the stage. Who is responsible? So how you are, uh, it's in your vision, the responsibility in the online platform and the brands in the front of the consumers. Okay, Neo, do you want to take us out? And then can we get the microphone over to behind you? Well, I guess we're, we're all responsible, right? <laughs> There's not one main main uh, responsible here, but you're absolutely right. And we heard the statistics before. Uh, a third of the consumers, the young consumers nowadays, have no problem at all in, in buying counterfeit. And that's frankly really worrying, right? And, and that's certainly one important front we, we, we need to work on and explain all the bad facts about counterfeits. We, we know them all. Uh, we need to convince the consumers, absolutely. And uh, we were talking before, they, they need to have tools to, to check as well. There's always a certain percentage of consumers who want to buy counterfeits, right? Those are more or less lost and they're always going to find it if, if they really want. But we need to make it very hard for them to find it first. Uh, and secondly, we need to convince the others and, and make sure that the others don't buy by accident any, any counterfeits. There's a lot of education needed here and that's the cheapest form of fighting counterfeits in the end. And absolutely crucial. J just one word. Uh, you're right, and I, I raised the, 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 the point. Uh, Buick should be there, and, 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 and but I know that there is some representative of the uh, of the consumers speaking tomorrow, today. I, I don't remember, um, but it is also very difficult to talk to the people. We we, we had that with, with uh, Unifab, and and, and we, we it, it, it's always difficult to find the right words because. Um, um, you shouldn't uh, try to make them feel guilty because it doesn't work. Uh, so yes, we, we, we have to, to, to explain more, but uh, to find the right words to, to explain. And going back on what Leo was saying, uh, I really think that we need to work as a platform on our point of view to create more educational measures and measures that we are actually displaying at every step of the, let's say, let's say the listing flow or the, um, the, the, the experience when you're purchasing something. And also, um, I think this will be in the next steps for Vinted, but also to go for more, let's say, anti-counterfeit communication campaign, meaning that Rome wasn't built in one day. We know that we still have a lot of work to do, but I think that if we show to people um, that we are ready to collaborate and that we are ready to do more. Um, it will also probably make, let's say, buyers or sellers who are willing to, to sell and buy counterfeit items to go on other platforms, unfortunately, but then to leave ours, which is actually our target, so. Um, maybe just one word. Um, obviously, in the, in the DSA, for example, there will be new obligations uh, when it comes to um, informing uh, the consumer if it has actually uh, happened that it has bought illegal content um, and, and, and that there will be some information obligations on, on, on that front that will follow. And also the new regulation on the general safety regulation, well the general safety uh, product uh, regulation that will uh, be probably discussed tomorrow in one of the breakout sessions. Certainly um, we will hear more um, about what role uh, for consumers they're in um, in terms of the existing legal framework. Okay, and I think one last question. Yeah, so the last, thank you. Kester from KLM, Royal Dutch Airlines. I want to support what Philips just said and also LVMH about the watches. If I am a consumer and I send a package from Hong Kong or the US through e-commerce when I buy it, as an airline, I get from my freight forwarder all the data. So I recently had one small container with 5,000 shipments. Because of the risk of the bomb on the aircraft, I get all data elements so I can do risk assessment. Now when it's about postal, I do not get it. So if I want to get a good, let's say I buy a laptop and I put it in bubble wrap in post, I do not get the data, I just get the receptacle from one post, general post office to the other. This is how you can circumvent the anti-counterfeit risk assessment systems that we have in place to help brand owners to battle this. 
I think also Ayata uh, was in a recent workshop talking about information exchange and how can we share this. So I think we don't have a level playing field today between e-commerce or postal flows, but today postal has the benefit. And I think also that the big platforms and the brand owners uh, could also help in, in getting that information. If you look at ICS2, we have the same difference. Uh, again, provisioning data to the EU in the new shared trader interface. Yeah, I, will, I will stop shortly. I see you looking on your watch. Is, just, is that a genuine watch or is it count? No, I'm kidding. It's a, it's a genuine watch. It's, it's yeah, genuinely nagging me. No, but I'll, me I'll finish off by saying if you look at ICS2 with the predict, we are getting the data. We are testing again with one master airway bill with 5,000 unique shipper concierge data. So you can do risk assessment as a customs entity on postal is very difficult to do. So we really should make a step into the future. Thank you. Okay, I see another question just here out of the corner of my eye. If we can get a microphone really quickly and keep it short. And one here in the middle, again, really quickly and keep it short. And then I'll let all the panelists respond uh, because we do have keynote speakers waiting in the wings. But since everyone is so interested in this conversation. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Uh, Margarita Sanivi, actually representing the European Consumer Centers. And yes, indeed, we've heard about the one third of consumers buying, potentially buying uh, intentional and counterfeit products, but there is also the other two thirds. And there are big, big risks, uh, health and safety risks posed by uh, consumers. And the big issue, at least, that we um, face uh, when dealing with consumer cases is the enforcement. How do they enforce their rights when um, sellers and manufacturers are based outside of the EU? So how can they go ahead with their rights? Because we also heard that consumers are pretty aware of the concept of counterfeits. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And we'll take the other point here briefly. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Felix Fernandez from HP. Um, so technological protection measures uh, can be very helpful to fight against counterfeit. However, the circumvention of those technological protection measures uh, can only be attacked from a copyright perspective. And uh, me personally, I, I kind of miss uh, the, the possibility of having a recourse to trademark infringement or patent infringement because of that circumvention of, of the TPM. Um, are there any plans? Have there been any considerations in that regard for the future? Thank you. Thank you. So I think to summarize those two questions, it's, it's what, how can consumers be protected and how can we deal with the, the counteracting or the circumventing of, 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 of actions? Um, who wants to start? I know, Jean-Paul, you had a point to make from the previous <laughs> few speakers. Well, no. Uh, I, I, I think that on ICS2, everybody is on a level playing field. Um, is it possible, uh, uh, first, um, nobody was ready uh, for uh, ICS to release two on the 1st of March because it will be delayed the, 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 the first for the airlines until the 1st of July and, and, and then the, the, the post should start on the 1st of October. I can tell you that the 1st of October it will not happen because we will not get uh, the, 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 the information necessary uh, coming from the rest of the world. I, I mean um, from, from, from many, many countries. Stop Act, active s since two years now, and, and, and nobody is 100% uh, um, EAD. So uh, it, 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 it will take time, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't work hard on this. And, 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 and once more, um, if there are misunderstandings, if there are things to discuss, there are plenty of, uh, uh, of uh, opportunity to do it at Post Europe. At the, within the UPU, we, we, we have um, uh, working groups with the IATA, with uh, ICAO, uh, with the WCO. So there are plenty of places to, to, to discuss and, and see how we, we, we move forward. But um, uh, well, I, I think that it was at least useful that I'm be, I be here. Uh, I think <laughs> <today>. so as well. <laughs> Those, uh, and, 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 and thank you for this. And, and I, I, I hear what. what, what 
is coming from, 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 from the room, and, and once more, we are available for uh, continuing the discussion. We have to, anyway. Thank you. Uh, May, let me bring you in. Um, one third of consumers may be up for buying counterfeit goods, but that's what about the two thirds who aren't? Um, how do they remain protected and their rights considered? You're meaning like what kind of measures that we're applying? Yeah, what kind of measures, what sort of focus do you think should be on the, the, the good two thirds? Um, so let's say I'm um, coming back to educational measures, but this is the, the, the first part. And then I think it's on, on our part in, in terms of like being a platform to make sure as much as possible that we are m removing um, enough counterfeit um, content. So mostly that's it, but um, yeah. That's responsibility all round. Claudia, final word from you. Um, I think we still have a long way to go. <laughs> so we need to keep on working, uh, keep on raising awareness about the importance of IP, facilitating IP enforcement, and, and obviously okay. ensuring that there is a flow of information sharing and cooperation beyond the regulatory framework that we will have in place. Um, for example, in the context of, of, of these discussions extended uh, with, uh, with the transport and postal uh, services, that's certainly an area we won't want to continue uh, engaging. So, And Leo, uh, final thought. I, I almost regret not opening the floor earlier because there's so many comments at the end. Yeah, uh, just, just very, very <laughs> shortly, to, to summarize what, when I think about our challenges moving forward, there's two, right? One is the volume and the other is the complexity. And the volume of cases just keeps on increasing year on year, and it's the same for all of us. There's more and more counterfeit, there's more and more small parcels, just more and more cases. And the counterfeiters are smarter. They're going to copy any, any blockchain, any, any smart tool we're going we're gonna to put in place. They will find a, a way to circumvent that. So these are the two big topics, uh, challenges for us. And one answer, one important answer to that is, is technology. But technology requires resources, right, uh, which, which are uh, scarce. Well, yeah. One last thing I want to add is that whenever we are um, implementing a new feature or anything, all the scammers, all the counterfeiters are actually much more smarter than we are. And they are always doing something better. And at some point, I really think that we need to collaborate more in a more efficient manner to be able, all of us, to, to tackle the bad content at the same time. Well, that's a good place to leave it. Thank you very much. A big round of applause for all of our speakers. So thank you very much. And I do like to see these slider word clouds working quite as well as they have. We started out where resources was the largest. Then we went through a phase where trust was the largest. Now it appears GDPR is the loudest. I think it shows how people are evolving and thinking during the conversation. So it's nice to see that we're actually reaching people. And of course, as well, the audience online able to participate in that. So we will be using that again tomorrow. So make sure that you uh, have your phones and memorize that uh, connection. We're going into our final block of keynote speakers just to wrap things up for today. Of course, it's not over, there's more tomorrow. But we're delighted to have, hearing from the consumer's point of view, has been raised a couple of times, from Malta, the chair of the Malta Competition and Consumer Affairs Authority, Helga Pizzotto. Yes, you mentioned consumers, so... I take it off from there. And uh, in the last panel, there was a lot of uh, talk about the role of consumers. And the last few words were volumes, the high volumes. The high volumes equals the number of consumer interactions. So if we address the consumer issue, we are not solving the problem, but we're definitely addressing a big part of it. The consumer at the end of the day generates intentionally or unintentionally demand, the demand that is fueling this um, uh, criminal activity, IP crime basically. So I will not talk to you about the importance of IP for consumers, but rather what we can do better to engage both consumers and consumers associations in this battle. We mentioned it this morning that the EU IPO has just um, published its latest survey on consumer perspectives and awareness. The survey was carried out in February this year, so it's very recent. It was carried out online 
with consumers 50 years 15 and upwards. The results, because we mentioned a lot of negatives, but there were also positive outcomes in this survey. The results indicate that more and more consumers perceive the purchase of counterfeits as harmful, and they agree that they should be respecting IP. There is also a general awareness of the risks associated with buying counterfeit products and downloading illegal content, so this is good news. Clearly, we heard there's one third that have purchased, of the youngsters in particular, that have purchased either counterfeit products or downloaded illegal content. And there's also an indication that a higher percentage would be ready to do so if the price was right or if they could not access the content from their current subscriptions. So there's much still to be done. So a few thoughts from my end of how we can encourage consumers to make more responsible decisions. And a lot of the points have been touched on. I have the disadvantage of being at the end of the day when most of the discussion has already taken place. But first, we need to continue with our current efforts on prioritizing how to increase, increase consumer awareness. Second, we need more initiatives that can help consumers and regulatory bodies effectively detect and remove from the market counterfeit or pirated products. Third, we need to create an environment where consumers are motivated to include IP in their many considerations when making purchasing decisions. The importance of raising consumer awareness has long been recognized. Educational material has been drawn up and campaigns have been run with positive results. This effort needs to be continued to be sustained. The Observatory's outreach to consumer representatives is also ensuring that the key stakeholders are more and more collectively engaged on this front. This is an important step in the right direction. Consumers typically turn to consumer authorities and consumer associations for information and guidance. EU-funded initiatives aimed at increasing consumers' value of IPR and undertaken with the partnership of consumer associations are good examples to follow and more similar initiatives would be beneficial. There is also merit in building a stronger linkage between consumer-focused agenda and the protection of intellectual property rights. Under consumer law, the sale of counterfeit or pirate products is considered a misleading and unfair commercial practice. But the negative impact these products leave go beyond a consumer being scammed and directly impact innovation, as we've heard this morning, can expose buyers to unsafe products, environmental threats, and cyber risks. Overall, they undermine markets that should be working for consumers. Better integrating IPR into the European consumer agenda would ensure a coordinated approach to raising awareness, fostering collaboration, and strengthening enforcement to create an environment that respects and protects intellectual property. With the growth of online sales and the difficulty of controlling what is made available to consumers, we should continue to invest in our efforts to help both consumers and market watchdogs identify sites that are likely to be selling counterfeit products or supporting piracy. From a consumer legislation perspective, the Omnibus Directive has been a much needed step in the right direction, as it has, amongst others, 
extended the scope of consumer protection law to address specific issues linked to online sales. While the directive does not have specific provisions related to piracy, the market oversight that is being set up to ensure the effective implementation of these new provisions can also serve to facilitate the identification of sites possibly selling products in breach of IPR. In addition, including sales of counterfeit products and the legitimate online content in the EU Commission's and consumer bodies coordinated sweep of websites is another initiative that could be looked into and that could serve to sensitize better consumer authorities to the extent of the problem, as well as provide valuable information for consumer information campaigns. This brings me to the point of enforcement. It's been touched on this morning, even now in one of the latest questions, and the issues that we have, particularly when dealing with cross-border enforcement cases where third countries are involved. As a consumer protection authority, we also have responsibility for product safety, and we regularly encounter products that do not meet EU standards and that pose safety risks. These substandard products, even if the majority are not per se counterfeit, also undoubtedly encroach into the legitimate market of IP holders. The EU has a well-established setup related to product safety. It includes a whole process of risk-based sample taking, verification of suspect products, and the REPEX platform that shares information between member states and also with the public in order to recall products and withdraw dangerous goods from the market. Why do I mention this? It's because the areas where we have high risks are children's clothing, electrical machinery and equipment, and toys. And I was surprised to see that they were also a high percentage of the products that are counterfeit that are arriving into Europe. So we don't just have a counterfeit issue, but we also have a product safe, a linked product safety issue. Within this context, a similar and what where possible linked process to that being adopted in respect of product safety is worth considering. Here I'd like to underline that whatever tools are set up, we, maximi we maximize on our current efforts and resources and where possible work together. We're mentioning the lack of resources. Let's not reinvent systems, reinvent the wheels. We need to work together, have more information sharing. We've been hearing about this all day. Set up interoperable IT systems and coordinate our enforcement actions. But even if we had the best market monitoring and enforcement mechanisms, on their own, they will never be enough as long as the counterfeit and piracy market remains lucrative. We must therefore adopt measures to raise the importance that consumers give to IP when making purchasing decisions. This was mentioned as well this morning, our messages have to be simple. I think it was mentioned by Jean-Paul, consumers get lost if, we are, if our commun uh, communication is not clear, simple, and addresses their particular circumstances. And I will mention the example we have with product safety. You would think that if you tell a person that the product they have just bought is not safe, they would not use it, or they would not buy it again. And there are a number of cases, not a few, when the consumers consider that you are not 
looking after their interests, but looking after market interest. And you really need to dig down to explain to them what is that element of product safety which they are being faced with, the exact risk they are being faced with. Affordability and accessibility continues to be two key drivers of illegal purchases. Affordability remains a matter for industry to address, but more initiatives can be taken collectively to facilitate accessibility and easy identification of sites selling genuine products or legal content. Consumer campaigns are also, also need to be widespread and sustained over time in order to bring about a change in buying behavior. Finally, we need to maintain the open discussion and the sharing of experience such as we are doing today in order to continue to, co to contribute to our collective efforts to keep up with the ever evolving challenges related to IP enforcement and consumer protection. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Helga. As you say, not an easy task to sum up at towards the end of the day. Um, we've got a final video statement now of today from Darren Tang, Director General at the World Intellectual Property Organization. So let's have a look at the exclusive message he sent for us. Your Excellency Thierry Breton, European Commissioner for the Internal Market. Your Excellency Christian Chambaud, Executive Director of the EU IPO. Your Excellency Vladia Borisova, President of the Patent Office of the Republic of Bulgaria. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to address the fifth International IP Enforcement Summit. On behalf of your friends and colleagues at WIPO, allow me to extend our warm wishes to everyone gathered in the beautiful city of Sofia. IP plays a critical role in supporting Europe's economic and social well-being. IP-intensive industries are worth over 6 trillion euros to the EU economy, supporting 80 million jobs, accounting for more than three quarters of intra-EU trade, and offering a wage premium of 40% over other industries. EU innovators are also amongst the largest users of WIPO's IP services, responsible for 5 in 10 designs and applications, 4 in 10 trademarks, and 2 in 10 patent filings last year. But just as IP rights promote investments in research and innovation, IP infringement undermines innovation and devalues creativity. The cost is not just economic. IP infringement weakens communities and threatens well-being as well. We know that, for example, counterfeit medicines pose a serious risk to human health, and that IP crime is closely associated with other illegal activities. Ultimately, an EU SME whose IP has been infringed is a third less likely to survive than one that has not. If this is how IP infringement stifles jobs and restricts business growth in one of the world's most dynamic economies, then the impact is likely to be even greater in other parts of the world. That's why the focus of this summit is so important and timely. As well as promoting IP enforcement in Europe, you understand that this is a matter which no agency or region can fight on its own. International cooperation is essential to protecting rights and rights holders and consumers, as well as to ensuring that IP remains a powerful catalyst for economic, social and cultural development around the world. Creating a positive and beneficial IP culture is one of WIPO's key objectives, cutting across many aspects of our work. Through the Advisory Committee on Enforcement, we facilitate international dialogue on topical issues around IP enforcement, cooperation, capacity building and awareness raising. We support member states to develop IP enforcement strategies, including by providing bespoke training for judges, law enforcement officials, rights holders, and others. WIPO Alert, our database of copyright infringing websites, seeks to prevent advertising revenue flowing to pirate sites. And we're increasing the delivery of impact-driven projects that build respect for IP on the ground around the world. With ARIPO, the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization, we have developed IP clubs that are supporting young kids and students in Botswana, Malawi, and Zimbabwe 
to learn about the importance of IP rights and develop a culture of love and respect for innovation. We will soon launch a new mobile game on IP designed to help youth discover the power of innovation and creativity. And platforms such as WIPO's IP Diagnostics tool to help SMEs understand their IP rights and take action to protect them has been accessed over 12,000 times and generated more than 2,000 customized reports for SME owners in its first full year of use. So the challenge now is to ensure that policy and enforcement keep pace with the digital transformation and the rise of new technologies. So that's why the Advisory Committee on Enforcement will consider AI issues at its next session. And that's why we have a standing invitation for more EU countries to join WIPO Alert and add to our growing database of almost 11,000 infringing websites. We will also continue to explore new ways of using our tools and technology to strengthen IP enforcement worldwide. To just take one example, we are working to help customs officers weed out counterfeit goods by creating a recordation system linked to WIPO's iPass software that's already used in more than 90 countries. We think this has the potential to be a game changer in the fight against counterfeiting, and we're pleased to be designing this system alongside the World Customs Organization and several member states. At WIPO, we believe strongly that partnerships spanning government, the public and private sectors and international organizations are key to unleashing the power of innovation and creativity in all parts of the world. So we look forward to continuing our important work with the EU IPO, including through the European Observatory on Infringements of IP Rights and joint capacity building activities. Together, we can build a stronger and more inclusive IP ecosystem, one that supports and protects innovators and creators anywhere in the world, and that brings the benefits of IP to everyone, everywhere. Thank you very much, and let me wish you the best wishes for a successful summit. Well, we've almost reached that point. Um, we've come to our last speaker of today. And it is last, but by no means least, the European Observatory on Infringements of Intellectual Property Rights, or the EU IPO Observatory, is doing sterling work, coming up with all the data to make those really well-driven decisions and advice. So we want to say a big thank you for the work that is being done. And also, to close today, very pleased to welcome to the stage, Alexandra Pauk, Acting Director. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We're now approaching the end of the first day of the IP Enforcement Summit, and I would like to very warmly thank all of our distinguished speakers, and indeed all of you participants here in the room, but also online, for a day of rich and engaging discussions. Allow me to highlight some key points, some key takeaways from these discussions. While a wide range of topics were addressed today, they could um, essentially be distilled into three main themes that are crucial for IP enforcement. Firstly, the need for more co cooperation between all players involved, and we've heard it from various speakers today. Secondly, involving intermediaries in cooperation, notably considering the technological developments, is key for a successful enforcement, especially online. And thirdly, the importance of widely raising awareness of the importance of IP and the consequences of IP infringement is also highly relevant. So let me come back to each of these themes and what role the observatory network is playing in that regard. First of all, today's discussions highlighted once again how crucial information sharing and cooperation are to tackle IP crime. This cooperation is needed at all levels to avoid loopholes which IP criminals are very, very quick to exploit. We need close cooperation between different enforcement players, so police, customs, prosecutors, market surveillance, at every level, uh, national, between member states, between the relevant EU bodies, and of course beyond that, internationally. The reintegration of IP crime in the EU uh, in the EU's criminal enforcement impact priorities, we've heard a lot about that today, has been a key driver to foster further cooperation through a series of concrete operational projects. This was a focus of today's first panel. Um, a report of, on the Operation Fake Star published on the 6th of June is a relevant example of what can be achieved 
with appropriate coordination and targeted efforts. Over 3,900 inspections in 17 countries led to the seizures of counterfeit clothing, footwear, and accessories related to 258 brands with an estimated value of 87 million euro. 300, almost 380, 378 individuals were arrested as a result of this European-wide operation. The operation had the support of several EU institutions and agencies, such as um, Europol, Olaf, Frontex, EU IPO, Eurojust, um, as well as a number of private companies, and as I mentioned, 17 member states, law enforcement authorities were conducting it. EU IPO is very proud to be supporting the actions on IP within MPACT, within, of course, our strictly non-enforcement operational mandate, so we support, and we are leading on the development of a practical handbook to help law enforcement um, investigate IP crime, which is full of very concrete examples. We also work with CPOL on training events and webinars. Indeed, increasing IP knowledge of enforcement authorities was addressed in one of the breakout sessions. Looking to the next impact policy cycle, we need to be mobilizing now. It needs to start now. We're almost halfway. It might seem that it's still early days, but it is not. We need to start thinking ahead to ensure that IP crime remains a priority from 2026 onwards. Of course, all of the actions, um, the operations that are un undertaken now and the results that we get will be key evidence in this regard. In this context, we will be supporting Europol as well in the drafting of a new report next year, highlighting the links between IP crime and other types of crime. And we hope to count on your support with cases for this impact action. Today's second panel addressed the information sharing to break down silos and foster cooperation between all players involved. Here, technology has a key role to play to enable effective and safe information sharing. Let me give you an example. Uh, it's, this is a real story. Um, a police officer, we heard this later on at a later stage, a police officer found some goods in one of the member states that he suspected of being counterfeits from a big clothing company. And as he wasn't sure how to confirm whether they were counterfeits or not, he actually went to his local high street and he walked into the shop of that clothing company and addressed the sales staff there and said, to whom can I speak? Are these products here, right next to me, are they counterfeit or not? Uh, now, of course, he shouldn't have needed to do it like that. We need to make these type, this type of information available easily. And there are solutions to help address this situation. Um, the IP enforcement portal, IPEP, that you know is a free, secure, and multilingual online tool that establishes um, the contact or enables right holders and the EU enforcement authorities to exchange information about IPR infringements and allows right holders to file and manage customs applications for actions. And in addition to the function to file the applications fully e electronically, we are working on a new mobile version. Um, our executive director mentioned it already uh, when he opened uh, this morning. A new version of IPAP to facilitate its use by frontline officers to swiftly communicate with rights holders and easily notify detentions. So we're hoping that this uh, enforcement officer uh, in the future will just easily just you know, take out his mobile um, and get the information he seeks. The aim is for all relevant players to use IPAP in not only customs and police, but also, of course, market surveillance and intermediaries. We are now um, recently launched the possibility for e-commerce platforms to log into IPAP. As IP crime is a global challenge, international aspects will also have to be considered. The second theme I would like to highlight is the need to work with intermediaries. When it comes to IP enforcement online, intermediaries have a central role to play in avoiding the misuse of their services to advertise, sell, and ship illegal products or provide access to pirated digital content. This was addressed in two breakout sessions. I'm talking about intermediaries in the broad sense here, not only the traditional e-commerce platforms, but also providers of services on social media, payment services, or transport and logistics. The diversity of intermediaries 
is reflected amongst the speakers today. The observatory, with its expert group on cooperation with intermediaries, has produced a number of important discussion papers looking at trends, challenges, and best practices. These papers, together with a series of dedicated stakeholder workshops, are feeding into the ongoing work of the European Commission on the EU toolbox against counterfeiting. And this summit offers, of course, another unique opportunity for stakeholders to provide input into the toolbox at a relevant moment in time in the uh, decision-making process. We are also in close contact with the European Commission to explore ways of how the EU IPO will support the implementation of the Digital Services Act on IPR-related uh, enforcement-related aspects, as also mentioned by our executive director. This collaboration is explicitly envisaged in the Digital Services Act, and we hope to be able to announce further details in the foreseeable future. A specific issue of fighting live event piracy was the subject of another dedicated breakout session today. <coughs> Excuse me. Here, too, a thorough observatory discussion paper published in March was highly relevant for the recommendations published by the European Commission on the 4th of May. The Commission invited the EU IPO to take up new tasks in supporting the implementation and monitoring of this recommendation. Um, as announced uh, by our Executive Director, on the 9th and the 10th of October, the EU IPO will host in Alicante a high-level event to launch a new specialized network of administrative authorities with the aim to promote the exchange of information and best practices between all member states on concrete measures to tackle live event piracy. Today, speakers from the um, International Olympic Committee, very topical with the Paris Olympics coming up in 2024, right holders and law enforcement authorities already discussed practical measures and best practices to address illegal broadcasting of live sports events. The third and final key theme emerging from today's exchanges, which I would like to highlight, is IP awareness. IP enforcement alone will never be enough to solve the problem of IP infringement. While fighting IP crime aims to tackle the supply chain of IPR infringing goods, raising awareness amongst all citizens of the negative consequences of counterfeiting and piracy is key to addressing the demand side. This is why it was important for us to have the consumer perspective reflected today with a keynote from the Malta Competition and Consumer Affairs Authority and a breakout session on raising IP awareness amongst consumers. IP awareness is an area where the EU IPO is also very active, as this is a central pillar of the observatory's role. A first step is the step to understanding the situation. Our latest IP perception study, published just a couple of days ago, shows that 80% of Europeans agree that counterfeits support criminal organizations and ruin businesses and jobs, 80%. Two out of three also consider fakes a threat to health, safety, and the environment. And 82% of Europeans agree that obtaining digital content through illegal sources entails a risk of harmful practices, scams or <clears throat> inappropriate content for minors, for example. However, instead of, uh, in spite of all of these um, results we got, Still, a third of Europeans find it acceptable to buy fakes when they consider the price uh, is right and uh, when they consider the price of the genuine product is too high. Uh, for young Europeans, this rises to half. So clearly, there is still some way of, of awareness raising um, to go. So once you understand the situation, the next step is raising awareness and shaping behavioral changes exploring how consumers can be further empowered in the fight against counterfeiting and piracy. Many of the observatory's ongoing activities aim to do just that. This ranges from pan-European media campaigns to fostering initiatives at national level through IP awareness grants or creating a network of authentic cities. And as was mentioned by the president of the Bulgarian Patent Office, Sofia is an authentic, authentic city together with three other Bulgarian cities, part of a growing EU network. Focusing on the next generation in, is particularly important. So we work on getting IP into the curricula from primary school to higher education, and 
through the Ideas Powered Youth Initiative, mobilize young creators and influencers from all over Europe on the protection and understanding of intellectual property. In closing, I would like to thank the Bulgarian Patent Office and the European Commission for co-organizing this summit with us. A big thank you also to our speakers and the respective organizations for their high-level engagement and commitment to the global fight against IP infringement. Thank you all again to you everywhere for the active participation today. Enjoy the evening in Sofia and see you tomorrow for the second day of the IP Enforcement Summit. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And of course, a thank you to all the organizers and the hosts and a thank you to you, the audience. Now, hands up who feels like they need a really good stretch right now. <laughs> okay, good. We're not done yet, though, because I have a lot of housekeeping notes to give to everyone. So please, please, please return your headsets that you've been using for translation. The table is over at the back of the room. Also remember to hold on to your badges for tomorrow because you will need them tomorrow because of those breakout sessions which are noted on your badge. And the agenda tomorrow starts at 9 o'clock here with a panel here in the main plenary room. Uh, obviously, we want you to enjoy Sofia and we do want you to keep tweeting using that hashtag IP enforcement or share it on LinkedIn or whatever social media platform you prefer. And finally, uh, we were kick-started this morning with the President of the Patent Office of the Republic of Bulgaria and we will finish, thanks to the Patent Office of Bulgaria again today, with a cocktail that takes place just outside the event now. If you go down outside Hall 3.2, and we can all have a chat about what we've learned today. And I will see you all tomorrow.